Welcome to chapter 16, where we're going to start switching from talking about just vague ideas of genes and talking about chromosomes to talking about genes specifically as pieces of DNA. Uh, so one of the main people that we're going to talk about is going to be Watson and Crick. They're some of the big guys, so that's the picture of them there uh, that's been drawn for a game called History of Biology. It's a free flash game that I haven't started playing too much, but I'm curious about. So if any of you guys get bored, it may not be a bad thing to investigate. Now, for this, I want to make sure you guys get a sense of the history of this, because it is kind of cool, where Mendel figured out that these things, genes, exist. And so with Mendel, we figured out, all right, there are such things as genes. You know, they, we can track them, we can, we can calculate things based on them. We know they're real, but we don't know what they are, because no one had any clue. And then with Morgan, we had this idea that genes are on chromosomes. And so he had this connection now uh, specifically because of meiosis and mitosis that whatever a gene is it's got to somehow be tied to a chromosome and that limited the field because at this point we knew that chromosomes uh, were about 60 40 in terms of DNA and protein and so there was two big candidates and both of them were pretty equal footing I guess you'd say although most people initially really favored the protein because there's 20 different amino acids versus four types of nucleotides. So if you're trying to store the code for life, most people are just like, well, 20 is bigger than four, so if I'm gonna you know, do something cool like a language, I would normally think 20 letters is better than four. Uh, so a lot of people were favoring protein, quite honestly, at the beginning part of this, and this is all the very beginning of the 1900s. And then we started to get people doing experiments on this, trying to figure out exactly which one it was. And so Griffith and Avery were two guys that started experimenting with mice uh, and infecting them ultimately with bacteria to see what would happen. And so Griffith was the one who discovered something called transformation, which is where bacteria can take pieces of DNA from the environment, so what we call naked DNA, and it's not being dirty, it just means that it's in the environment by itself because the cell it was in is kind of disintegrated. It's died and broken up. And they're able to take stuff like that and take some of the genes that they've grabbed and use them. And so if I mix a bacteria in with a bunch of this DNA that's just floating around, I can sometimes see it will express a new trait that was on that floating DNA. So that process is called transformation and Griff discovered this. The next slide I'll talk more about how. And then Avery was a guy who kind of continued Griffith's work. So a lot of times they're packaged together as Griffith and Avery, but in reality they kind of were two phases where Avery looked at Griffith's stuff and continued it and said, you know what, the process by which we did this seems to implicate DNA as being the guy. So he's one of the first ones to really point his finger experimentally at DNA as being the genetic information. So the experiment, which will make this all make more sense, is they gave it this rough strain, that means it did not have a capsule. They gave it this rough strain of a particular bacteria, they gave it to the mouse, and we have a mouse live. So everybody's happy, you know, no one's calling PETA. Then they gave it this smooth strain, which really just has a capsule that protects it and kind of masks it. So when you do that, when you give it the S strain, ultimately you get a dead mouse. So in this case, we'll do a frowny face. Uh, and then when you take and kill the lethal strain, you heat it up and, and destroy it, essentially, and then give that to the mice, the mouse lives because you've killed the bacteria. The bacteria then can't really infect it, so mouse is happy. But, and I don't know why Griffith decided to do this, but it was awesome, he mixed some of the non-lethal bacteria that were alive with some of the remnants of those killed lethal bacteria. So at this point, we have naked DNA or naked genetic information, I guess you could say, from the original lethal guys floating around with the non-lethal guys. And some, a small number, of those non-lethal guys picked up that DNA, or picked up the genetic information, if we're not letting the cat out of the bag yet that it's DNA, uh, and used it and became smooth DNA, or smooth DNA, geez, oh, Pete's, uh, became smooth bacteria and killed the mouse. So even if I gave it the non-lethal strain, if I mixed in the pieces of the lethal strain, I get a dead mouse. You know, mission accomplished. We killed it. Uh, and so this allowed them to realize the idea of transformation, obviously, that some of this DNA could make it into the non-lethal. But Avery was the one smart enough to go, you know what, protein gets damaged by heat. 
So if our genetic information was stored in protein and I heat it to kill the bacteria, whatever genetic information was stored there in the protein would be destroyed as well. So it would not be available for those non-lethal guys, the rough strain guys, to grab and use. And so therefore, protein cannot, according to this experiment, be the genetic information. That leaves us only with the other guy, DNA, who's much more stable and would not be affected by heat as much. And so that's the upshot of these, is this is the first experiment, or experiments, I guess, because two guys did it separate times, that really said DNA is the guy, not protein. But some people weren't fully convinced. So Hershey and Chase came along and said, all right, let's see if we can figure this out. And they were pretty smart, so they said, you know what? We've got these viruses, and these viruses are generally composed of just two things, proteins and DNA, or some other genetic info. We're using ones of DNA. And those are the only two possibilities, because that's what cro chromosomes are made of. So we know it's going to be one of these two guys. So they said, we're going to take some of these viruses, and we're going to have them be produced in the presence of uh, radioactive sulfur. Radioactive sulfur is only going to be in the proteins. So for the radioactive sulfur guys, that's going to be tracking the proteins of the virus. They then had a separate set of viruses that they had that they produced specifically inside of radioactive phosphorus, which would only be found in the DNA of the virus. So they had these two separate things going on, one that's tracking the protein of these viruses, one that's tracking the DNA. They then allowed them to infect the bacteria. They then spun, they centrifuged them, so spin them around really fast. It's like the Gravitron at the fair and you stick to the walls. So the, the bacteria, which are more massive, sink to the bottom and form a pellet. And then the fluid above it, called the supernatant, just kind of floats there with whatever else was just free, whatever else is just in the fluid, in the water, that's not in the bacteria. And so they did this experiment, went through, did all the centrifuging, and what they found was in that pellet in the bottom, so essentially in the bacteria, there was no radioactive sulfur. All the radioactive sulfur was in the supernatant, the liquid. So that radioactive sulfur never went inside of a bacteria. It was outside the bacteria. They found the radioactive phosphorus, the DNA, was inside the bacteria. So it was in that pellet that contained the bacteria at the bottom, which means the DNA did enter the bacteria. So because they knew the genetic info had to enter the cell to take it over, they had the culprit red-handed. Or in this case, they're using the green radioactive phosphorus, so I guess green-handed in this situation. So this one definitively proved DNA was our genetic information. So it ended the debate. So this is getting towards the middle of the 19th century now, and we know that DNA is our guy. We know this is who we're after. But we still didn't know that much about DNA. We didn't know its structure. We didn't know how it stored the information. We just know that somehow it did store it. And so this is where our story continues, where now we have this race as people try to say, well, how does DNA work? You know, Can we crack essentially what the code is, how we take this sugar, nitrogen base, phosphate group, and take over and over and mix them up somehow and get a structure that records all this information. And so Shargaff was one of the first guys that came up with a set of things that helped us with Shargaff's rules, where he studied different species and realized that each species tended to have where the amount of adenine equaled the amount of thymine and the amount of cytosine essentially equaled the amount of guanine. I mean, it's pretty close. Now, different species had different amounts of adenine. So you could have one species has on average about 15% adenine, 15% thymine. And then if they have 15 and 15, this has to add up to 100. So this is 30 total. So that means we got 70 left. So you'd have 35 cytosine, 35% guanine. And then different species might have 20, 20, and 30, 30. You know, it'd vary. But he'd always see this connection somehow between the amount of adenine and the amount of thymine and the amount of cytosine and the amount of guanine. So that was one of those useful steps for us uh, along this pathway. And so Watson and Crick knew about all this, and so they were modelers that started to try to take uh, some information that they'd gotten from Rosalind Franklin. So I should write her down, because she's a famous woman who didn't really get much credit because she died too early. Uh, but they essentially snuck, because they got her partner to give it to them, so they essentially snuck some X-ray crystallography pictures that she'd taken of DNA. So these could be used to kind of check your work. It didn't give them how to get the answer. It didn't give them the structure, but it allowed for them to build structures and check to see if that structure would give them the right image. If it did, then they knew they had the right structure. And so they kept building and building until they eventually came up with a double helix. 
where they have a backbone that's going to be sugar, that's the blue parts, this red part's the phosphate, so phosphate and sugars and the nitrogen bases stick into the middle and they hydrogen bond together. And so that's the double helix is every 10 nucleotides it does a turn. So it's this twisted ladder, two strands, where the sides are made out of a phosphate and sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and the rungs, the middle parts, are going to be nitrogen bases that are attached to the sugar. So these nitrogen bases will stick out in the middle and hydrogen bond together. You can see there's a gap because they don't officially, like rigidly bind, they're just attracted to each other. So they form these hydrogen bonds that help hold the two strands together. Although the weak point of DNA is always in the middle. It's always in the middle of those rungs where it can kind of pull apart. So they were able to figure out the structure of nucleotides, how the nucleotides are arranged. They figured out the structure of DNA. And by us knowing now exactly how we structure this, we can see how the sequence of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine is how we store stuff. It's just even though there's only four things because they can be so long, you know, one gene can be up to thousands of nucleotides, it's able to store enough information to kind of design or to, to create a protein because it can be so long, even though it's got so few pieces. So they were able to figure out this bonding pattern. So just to make sure we're clear, uh, you're always going to have adenine bind to thymine. So adenine, thymine. And then down here, we've got the same basic idea where this guy will be adenine and this will be thymine. Now, adenine and guanine, that's these guys, they're going to be what are called purines. And the way I remember that is purines are the bigger guys. They have two rings. So you'll see they've got these two rings that are part of the nitrogen base. Whereas primidines have the long name, but they're actually the small guys. So they're going to have one ring. And if you look closely as well, you'll see thymine has this oxygen NH oxygen pattern. Whereas if you look at the cytosine right here, you'll see it's got this NH2 up at the top, and then it's got a nitrogen, and then it's got an oxygen. Uh, so if you look at this, you'll see they're different, is all I care about. You don't have to memorize this, but just realize they're not the same structurally. Because of that, they don't want to form the same hydrogen bonds. And so if I line up adenine and thymine, they line up perfectly to allow us to form these two hydrogen bonds, which are stable, and so it sticks them together well. But you'll see the directionality and the number of hydrogen bonds is different between cytosine and guanine, which is why these guys line up and work well together, but they will not line up and work well together with anybody else. And so this is why adenine will bind to thymine, and this is why cytosine will hydrogen bond to guanine, but only those. And this is important because it makes DNA so stable. You know, we don't really have to worry too much about screwing up the order of things. If you have an adenine, it's going to get together with a thymine because that's what's chemically stable. That's what's chemically acceptable. So we don't have to worry about suddenly a cytosine just slipping in there. It's just not going to happen, uh, or at least very, very, very rarely happen. And this is useful because it helps us keep the integrity of DNA. It helps us make sure that we don't screw up too much because if we screw up, there can be dire consequences. So it makes it a very stable code. And then just as our, our last bit here, I want to get into Watson and Crick a bit, and then I'm going to kind of leave it, and we'll pick up the rest of the next podcast about uh, DNA replication. But Watson and Crick did come up with the idea of how DNA replicated, and we're going to do this in general terms, where they figured out because there's complementary bases, and that's just the idea that A and T, C and G stick together, they figured out it'd be pretty easy to just peel apart DNA, just split it down the rungs, and rebuild the strand. Because if I expose an adenine that's now by himself, a nucleotide containing thymine would come in there and bind because that's the only guy who could stably interact. And if I expose a cytosine below that guy, then a guanine would come in and it would bind because that's the only guy that can stably interact. So each strand, if we split one double helix, each half of that double helix can be used as a template to reliably build the strand again, to build the other missing part. And so afterwards, if we go through and rebuild the second half of each, we now have two identical pieces of DNA. We've done DNA replication. We've copied the DNA. So they were able to figure this out. Anti-parallel we'll talk about later. That just means the DNA runs in different directions. It's a lot like a road, where if you look at a road, there's two parts of it. And one part will run kind of up, and the other part will run down. So overall, they still will interact where there'll be an adenine and a thymine, and there'll be a cytosine and a guanine and all that. But it's just one of them will have a phosphate on the far end, if you will, and one of them will have a phosphate on the near end. 
that's all it really comes down to is the backbone runs in opposite directions. That'll have more significance with what we cover later. And then Mendelssohn and Stahl, these are the guys that came up with how this process works that they weren't sure if you split the DNA and then you made templates and stuck the, like, or I shouldn't say, you took these templates that we just separated and that we ultimately made like a, a copy, another part of it, and stuck the copies together and then the original parts of the DNA went back together. So they weren't sure if what we were going to find was conserved DNA replication where at the end of DNA replication, we had essentially one completely old strand of DNA and one completely new one, or if it was going to be half and half, where essentially one strand was going to be half old, half new, because we have the original side that was the template, and then the new one we just built, the new half. And there was also what's called a dispersive model, where it's going to be like bits and pieces. So that was kind of a weird one where like parts of it were all old and parts of it were half old or all new. It was a weird model. It was wrong. Uh, and so Mendelssohn and Stahl used where the old strands of DNA, the original strands of DNA, were made from one particular isotope of nitrogen that had a specific mass. Uh, the new types of ones, the new nucleotides they were using, uh, were comprised with one that's called a light version of nitrogen. It weighs less. So they could essentially take this and figure out the mass to try to see what was going on. If they did this and they found that strands were either all heavy or all light, they would be able to figure out that this is conserved, where strands are either all old or all new. If they got where the strands were ultimately half and half, that would be semi-conservative, where the strands were always half old, half new. And if they got some weird data that made no sense, then it's dispersive apparently. So when they did this, they found that after one division, if you will, one replication process, it, each strand was half and half, which fit the semi-conservative model which is that you have essentially one old strand and then the other part of it is going to be new. And then they did this again and found that it was 25% because once again, we're splitting this up. And so we now have the old half is gonna be a template again, but it's gonna have a new piece paired with it. And then the new piece that we built originally is gonna get a new piece. So we're gonna end up with three new pieces and one old. That fits semi-conservative replication. So they kept doing this just to verify, but this is where semi-conservative replication comes from. We take the old strand, we split it in half, we build new strands to fill it out, to make it complete. Whenever we want to replicate again, we do the same process. We split it up, we use each of those as a template, and we just rebuild new pieces for it until it becomes complete and we're done. Nothing else fancy. Hope you guys have liked this, and I'll see you guys next week.